You think I did? Yep. Yes, it is. Green is for go ahead, right? Good evening. Good evening. Gu Guten Abend. Arato. Arato. And that's that's it. <laughs> that's all all I know. Let us uh, pray and uh, ask the Lord to anoint and bless our understanding tonight. So we thank you, Lord, for just the awesome favor that you granted us in Jesus, that we might know you, might uh, have a purpose in, in this life expression that you've granted us, and you've grafted us in the midst of your people and caused us to see visions and dream dreams and, and uh, have richly blessed us, and we thank you. We pray tonight that as we study that you would bless by your anointing and understanding uh, that we might be more fruitful even in this day that you've called us. We thank you and bless you and praise you. Amen, amen. All right. Can somebody name a famous preacher of two or three hundred years ago? Any, doesn't matter. Cotton Mather, Massachusetts maybe, somewhere in New England, and, and around, around the time of the Revolution, I guess, something like that. Charles Finney. Hi, Charles Finney. And Charles Finney was a real big faith preacher, uh, preached all over New, New England, and just, uh, you know, he just preached the sinners right down on their knees, as I understand it. <laughs> so, you think, you think any of those guys would swap places with you if they could had the opportunity? I, th I think they would. I think they would. I mean, I mean by that. I'm, I mean by that that the awesomeness that we that's evident in our day is such that that I think almost any generation would uh, would swap if they had that opportunity. Pardon? Right. That's. That's the, that's the point, that's the point. And, then, and we have such incredible opportunity. I mean, now a bunch of you are getting ready in what? A month to, to uh, get on an airplane and zip your way over to Israel and walk around the land for a couple of weeks, work in the land, interact with the people, get on the airplane, come back. You're gonna eat wonderful food, ride around in air conditioned buses, and uh, come back. That's something that's just totally unique in our day. I mean, in in a hundred years ago, only the very very wealthy would have been in a position to do. So, it not only is the things happening, but you have the privilege of of uh, being able to be a part of it, really, not just totally remote. So, it's an awesome day. All right. Last week we talked about Gnosticism. And somebody asked the question, uh, where did these guys come up with these spooky stuff? And I, uh, obviously out of the pit, uh, but uh, I asked myself the question, why did they come up with it? And, and it seemed to me like the, a, more, a more significant question is why? Uh, and and I, believe, I believe I have a, at least some insight into why. It's just pure unbelief. Unbelief. Yeah, unbelief. I mean, if you, if, you, if you have a solid faith foundation in the scriptures, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're strong in belief because of, of, you know, faith is a gift of God. That's what Paul wrote, isn't he? You not say you're saved by faith, and this not of yourself, but is the grace of God. Something like that. Somebody read Ephesians two eight. Is that it? I'm not sure that's the right address, but it's closer. I don't want to misquote it too badly. Anyway, uh, faith is a gift of God, and uh, and so and so the Lord has blessed us with a wonderful, uh, abundant faith. Somebody found that. You're referring to Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and 
Okay, so faith is a gift of God. That that was my point. Uh, uh, so 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 you've been you've been you've received incredible grace to have solid faith. Okay, uh, uh, I I believe that the philosophers that generated Gnostic thought, they were philosophers, uh, but I I believe I believe they they could not believe what you see happening and are participating in today. Like it was beyond their... In, in other words, uh, almost all of prophecy has to do with the ingathering of the Jewish people to the land and the establishment of the kingdom of God on the planet. And, and, uh, and I, think, I think they didn't simply had, didn't have the faith to believe it and, and therefore had to generate philosophies uh, you know, they sat down on a th stump and thought it out, and this is, must be what God is going to do or how he's going to do it. J I think it's just pure unbelief that, that, that t would turn a person to philosophy to the degree that they would generate the myths uh, that were, were generated in, uh, in Gnosticism. So, any other con con you've all thought about Gnosticism for a few days now. Any other thoughts concerning that? No, you didn't think. Uh, <laughs> all right. We're going to... Uh, the last chapter in the little textbook is uh, on the subject of the so-called pre-tribulation rapture. Now, please, please, please understand that the concept of the rapture, actually the term is not used in the scriptures, but... I will move in. The, the idea the idea that at some juncture in the future at the coming of the Lord uh, we're going to be a believer. Whoever is counted in the cut will be transformed experience resurrection instantaneously transformed. Paul said, in an instant, in a twinkle of an eye, we shall be changed. Uh, we shall be made like him. We don't know. I think John said, we don't know what we shall be, but we know that uh, when he appears, we'll be made like him, something to that effect. Uh, so, so the idea of the so-called rapture is, is thoroughly scriptural. Uh, so there's no, we're not we're not questioning the concept of the rapture. Uh, I, I think that's from a Christian perspective, New Testament perspective. It's as straightforward and clear as virtually any any concept we have. What we're questioning is when it will occur. What are the events leading up to its occurrence? And and uh, the the now. Every, everybody understands, I think, what did I do with the chalk? I lose it already? If I did a little timeline, uh, we're, time-wise, we're here. At, at some point, Jesus returns. What, good planning? At some point, if, if we plot time, earth time, space time, uh, at some point, in, can you all see that on this board? I don't know if you can see it or not. At some point in the future, uh, Jesus is going to descend, and you know the guys, the angels spoke to the believers on, uh, on the Mount of Olives as he ascended, and said he'll come in just the same way. So, so we believe that he'll descend onto the Mount of Olives uh, at some juncture in time in the future. Now, so the the pre-tribulation. Now, some people some people uh, believe or interpret prophecy so that there's seven years. There's a special time frame. 
seven years preceding his return. So, well, actually, it, it, we all know that there will be a seven-year period before he returns. So, so the idea then is this is what's referred to as the uh, tribulation period. And so about 200 years ago, uh, there appeared a, a prophecy in England uh, concerning uh, what, what, would be, what would be turned uh, secret return. So, so there's a secret return of Jesus and it comes seven years. In other words, Jesus is going to descend twice. The first time he's going to descend, uh, believers at this secret return, believers are going to be taken off the scene. The, that's the pre-tribulation rapture. And then, and then God's going to beat up on everybody that remains that are left behind. You're going, to beat, you're going to beat up on them for, for that seven years. And then, and then the, the real finale of the thing, Jesus is going to come again. And actually, I usually don't talk much about what happens at that point, but, but that's as far as, the, you know, how, how Lindsay didn't write anything beyond that point. So we, we don't know what's going to happen then. Anyway, so, so the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture centers around uh, uh, a secret appearing of Jesus and re removing believers. And everybody has a little bit different definition of what that would, who, who would be, make the cut. Um, but but they would be taken out, and then the world is left. Actually, actually Israel is left holding the bag at that point. Uh, uh, so they're they're the only remaining people that are responsive to uh, to uh, the Lord at all. And so somehow they uh, they'll be God's witness during that period of time, uh, even though God's beaten up on them too. But anyway, that's you know that's that's what Jews deserve anyway. I reckon so. So they go ahead and they go ahead and uh, some theory like that. Okay, pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Remember now, we're not questioning the question of if there's a rapture or not a rapture, uh, a time, a transition of believers into into the resurrection. That is uh, thoroughly established. It's just a question of of the timing of when it occurs. It, and this theory uh, promotes the idea that it's a secret thing. And so, and so uh, this, this was popularized in recent history by Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth. When I became a believer, uh, uh, I, I guess late great planet Earth was one of the first books that somebody put in my hand. And so I read it, and I thought, boy, this is wonderful. I like this stuff. You like that stuff? Uh, well, I loved it. I loved it. And in fact, I loved it. I loved it so much, I did a little research on how Lindsay found out that he was a student of uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And so I, I, looked up, uh, I looked up who are the professors at Dallas Theological Seminary, and I discovered that one Dwight Pentecost was the primary professor that, that uh, taught prophecy and so on, and he's the one that Hal Lindsey was really uh, quoting and so on, or following. And so I, or he, he had written a very, uh, a very massive book on prophecy called Things to Come. So I ordered the thing, and I read it and studied it, and, but there was uh, something going on in there. Now, one of the, one, I was talking about this to somebody the other day, I've forgotten who it was, so... I'll repeat it. Uh, one of the things that you do, uh, attempt to do in, in physics, and I was kind of trained in this direction, is that uh, 
you, if, you got, if you're doing experiments and you got a whole bunch of data to try to deal with, uh, now everybody's going to have an opinion. Now, if you're Mr. Klein, you have two opinions. But, <laughs> but, but everybody, has a, everybody has an opinion, and so, and so uh, it's very difficult to take your data and analyze your data without allowing your opinion to warp how you look at it. So you, so you learn to be extremely careful about guiding the interpretation of your data. You got to let the data speak for itself and draw your conclusion after you see all the data and try to analyze it a adequately. And so, and so as I work my way through things to come, it was, and it was a monstrous sized book, as I did that, I got this strange feeling that these boys were allowing their notions to influence their data. In other words, they were taking scriptures out of context and you know, twisting it to, to support their argument. And, and so that was, that was not good. And so that you know, raised a flag, I guess I'd say, uh, for me on this issue. And now I dealt with it for years before I finally came to hard conclusions on the theme. Darby. Darby popularized it in England. Lean toward what? Oh, okay. And, uh, well, almost all evangelicals do. Yeah. I have. I have no idea right at the moment. I bought a book about 40 years ago called The Incredible Cover-Up by a gentleman of the name of David Dave McPherson. And he, do, he, he did a, a detailed documentation of the types of things that you're asking. And it's been ages since I read it. And uh, uh, Pier, McPherson. M M A M A C P H E R S O N Dave McPherson, uh, the incredible cover up, and so he's he's he is he is talking he's talking about the evolution of this theory. As I as I understand it, there was a a, a church in England supporting uh, at least to some degree gifts of the Holy Spirit, young lady prophesied in one of the meetings about a secret coming of Jesus and the rapture occurring and that that concept caught on no and uh, it was popularized by then popularized by Darby and after after Darby popularized it uh, it was it was furthered by C.I. Schofield C.I. Schofield uh, to, to develop a, a interpretation of prophecy and, and loaded that interpretation into interpretations of the Schofield Bible. And, and then in this country, uh, we're talking generations now, in this country, it, it was picked up in, by Dallas Theological Seminary and, uh, and uh, Mr. Dwight Pentecost is the writer that I was talking about. And, and others, and so popularized then in our era by by uh, Hal Lindsey. And the lately, and 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 a few years ago, when we when I lived in California, some many many decades ago, uh, there was a gentleman out there that I, he was a teacher of whatever. I, as I recall, I'm turning it, around, put it in my pocket. Uh, by the name of uh, who, who, uh, what's the guy's name? Tim LaHaye. And uh, I don't I don't remember now how I encountered it, but I encountered uh, uh, La Hayes, and uh, decided that they were selling snake oil, and so whatever. <laughs>
and so anyway then he wrote a, he he did a whole series on the so called the subject of the you know the series of called left behind i think and that he's he's talking about the aftermath of the rapture and that seven year period so i never looked at the series cuz i didn't have any confidence in mr lahey so uh, anyway, so that kind of gets the evolution of this story. One of the amazing things to me is, now this theory, pre-tribulation rapture of the church, is almost universally accepted in the evangelical church. Well, we won't get there. We'll, we're going we're gonna to look at some... It's not, it's not based on anything. I mean, there's... One of the questions in the, in the little booklet is, can you, you know... The, the, the concept, let a thing be established in the mouths of two or three witnesses, and that's kind of an interpretive pattern that we ought to exercise. So one of the questions in, in your book is, can you, can you give us uh, two to three solid scriptures that clearly uh, indicate that the so-called pre-tribulation rapture? And I think you're going to have trouble doing that. So. Uh, well, you can find some that you can find some things that well, well you could maybe understand them that way. It's fine. I th I think the stuff that counters it is much stronger, and so we're gonna we're gonna look at that. So okay, uh, so that so this is what we're really talking about. So before to I can't get my stuff here. I got I lost my little flipper. It's in my pocket. And it's well, yeah, it's underneath the. Mike. So now we got it. See if I can still work it. Ah, uh -uh, look at that. Deadly. Can I do it that way? <laughs> so, so, uh, so I want to start tonight by setting forth a kind of. Now this is going to be a kind of an interpretation of of the of the whole uh, basis of the scripture revelation, the the revealing of God's plan of redemption. It's taken a very, I'm going to, in a few minutes here, we're going to look at three different views of very broadly of how we interpret the whole, whole message of the Bible. Um, and so I'm going to start out with the correct one, of course, the Zamok view. <laughs> Obviously, it's the correct one. Uh, So, so if we if we begin in if we if our we begin in Genesis and just work our way through the scriptures, uh, is there a systematic understanding of what God's doing that's that's clearly visible? Now, different people are going to come up with different pictures. That's just the way it is. We know in part. We prophesy in part. So, so the best that we can do is present our, some possible views, and then, then you have the responsibility then to open the Bible and study and see, see if it stands up to what the Bible is actually telling us. So, all right, here we go. So, we start out with the Garden of Eden experience. Everybody's Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, they, uh, they got in a little trouble and uh, got uh, driven out of the garden separated from the tree of life, which, which I maintain is communion with the Holy One. Is, is when, I, when the Bible talks about eating the tree of life, I, I believe it's talking about direct communion between a human uh, entity and, and directly with God. And I, I believe in the Holy Spirit we have, uh, we have uh, 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 what, earnest... I think that's what Paul talked about, earnest of the Holy Spirit. We have an essence of that, although it's not enough to, not enough to keep us from dying or not enough to... Now, it was enough in Adam. Do you all believe that it was enough, the communion between God and Adam was enough that had he walked in righteousness that he would not have ever experienced death? See, I, I, I believe that that had Adam maintained his posture, that he would never experience the deterioration, aging deterioration of, of the human 
body to experience death. Uh, so, well, that's academic. He did, and so here we are. Uh, so, but we have the garden experience, all right, and then, and then if you, from Genesis 4 through 11, uh, we see, we see uh, one, two, two things obvious. Uh, Satan is, is having a field day with the human community. Uh, what, what, what's the outlook of the situation before the flood? What does the Bible say about the general situation? And they were only, only evil, only evil continually. So, so Satan, Satan grabbed, Satan grabbed the human experience, and through deception, uh, temptation, deception, whatever, uh, uh, was driving man into the pit fast. And so, and so God intervened in the flood. And he found one family that found favor, uh, one man that found favor, uh, Noah, and his wife and his three sons and their wife. So eight people. Uh, so, so it seems evident what God decided to do. I have a relatively righteous group of people here, eight people, and I'm going to cause all subsequent mankind to, to, be, to be derided from them. And, and so they're relatively righteous, and so the relatively unrighteous uh, got taken out of the sperm bank. We talk about that? Something like that? So, so God did a little selective breeding. On the farm, you do selective breeding with cattle and so on to, to enhance the type of qualities in the cattle that you are looking for. If you're a dairy farmer, you're looking for uh, uh, cows that can give high butterfat content milk and lots of it. And so you selectively breed to accomplish that. If you're, if you're in the beef business, you're breeding um, a beef stock uh, to um, load up on uh, muscle tissue that's good for slaughter and for the production of beef and so on. Dairy cows are poor for beef quality. Uh, Angus is wonderful for beef quality. Holsteins are not. Uh, they've been bred for different reasons and developed along those lines. So, so God did a little selective breeding. He said, I'm going to cause all the rest of mankind to come from one righteous branch. All the unrighteous ones got and all the relatively unrighteous ones and the relatively righteous ones, if they actually were there, we don't know. Uh, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Sattler brothers sing about that, you know, so you know that. I think it's the Sattler brothers, one of those guys. Okay. Uh, so, so God limited the manifestation of evil in the earth through the flood. Now man was living close to a thousand years before he died and in the process God said I'm going to reduce their lifespan to 120 years and so that's what he did also reduce their lifespan how did he do that but that's always intriguing to me how did he do it now you you, you read the Bible and you think that that after Noah and his sons, the next generation is going to live to be 120. But they don't. They live to be 600, 400, 200, and so on. It's, a, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a step function. I lose my chalk. It ends up starting out at 950 or something like that. It goes out there and drops down to 600 and something, drops down to 400 and something over a few generations, 200 and something, and then down to the time of Moses, it is Psalms 90 or 91. It's 70 or if by strength 80. And today we're staggering to get to 120. And there, every now and then you see somebody 
getting close to 120. All right, so how did, how did God actually reduce the lifespan? Uh, my theory, uh, before the flood, there was an envelope of water that encompassed the whole earth. That, uh, that, uh, the, that is why I believe that there are huge oil deposits on the polar areas. Because if there's oil deposits in the polar regions, there were vegetation at some point there for it to, to, to occur. I believe that there was a, a huge, like a greenhouse, uh, encompassing the earth, and it was made up of water. And it, when, when, when God caused a flood, that water fell for what? How long? 40 days and nights, continually raining. Now, that almost happens in Kentucky every winter. <laughs> you swear that's what is happening, but it's not, it's not as continuous at least. Anyway, I mean, that's the, that's, that's the awesome thing about winters up there is it, it, it gets slate over, gray overcast in November and it blows off in March. And, and so every while you just, get, you just get this, there's this cloud over me all the time. So anyway, anyway, when, now, I always say to people, if you, if you, you know, back years ago when, the, when everybody feared the Cubans were going to send missiles over with uh, nuclear explosives or whatever, or, or the Russians or now the Iranians or the North Koreans, whoever might do that sort of thing, uh, uh, if, if, you, if you're rich enough to have a swimming pool and, and you had missiles incoming, get you, a, get you a garden hose so that you can breathe and jump in the bottom of your pool. Because water is a good shield for radiation. Water is a good shield. And, and, so, and so I believe that that envelope of water, this greenhouse uh, canopy of water all, all encompassing the whole earth, uh, provided a radiation shield from, from cosmic rays from the sun. And, and so, and so when, the rain, when the rain came down, that shield was removed. And what happened then, in successive generations, they had uh, chromosome damage as a result of uh, cosmic radiation, in, much increased cosmic radiation. And it brought it down to where we are today. So, now th that's my explanation to how, it, how God did it. That's just my explanation, for good or bad or whatever. Well, it may be. I don't remember seeing it there. He, does he have Schrodinger equation in there too? <laughs> does he have Schrodinger equation in there too? I thought Job had Schrodinger in there too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So, so, so God decreased lifespan. So, 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 but what did God do with the decrease of lifespan? By the time you really, really, really know how to do evil really well, you die. Uh, can you take, can you take a, a Stalin or a Hitler and let them run 800 years and so on? How bad, how, how bad could they be? So, so uh, by the time you really get good, you check out. So I, God limited manifestation of evil. And then man came together and, and formed an international union under the tyrant Nimrod. Did I do it again? <laughs> under the tyrant Nimrod and... Uh, and all, all mankind was under a single authority, under Nimrod, as a tyrant. And God said, I'm going to have to break that up. And so he went down and confused their language at Babel and made cooperation among mankind all, virtually impossible. And everybody was driven out in their separate... I don't know if he did every individual language or every family. I don't know how, he, how that broke down, but... but uh, and I always use the example, if you, if, for, for me at least, if I'm in a foreign country by myself and I'm hearing a language I don't understand, it, I not only do not understand it, it is agitating to me. It grates on me to hear it. 
Uh, and I think, I think what God did is made, made people mutually repulsive, different peoples almost repulsive to one another in that regard, and driven them out, and the nations as such were formed. And, and, so, and so now he struck Babel, but Babel didn't die. It just got tampered out. So I, I say in this period then, God limited the manifestation of evil in the earth through mankind. Now, we're talking about op mankind operating free will under satanic deception and manipulation. Uh, and now, you by your own free will chose to make Jesus Lord in your life. And that, that's... I'm, I'm sure that's going to be something, a banner that you'll wear eternally. You've chosen to do that. Uh, much of mankind, I would suggest, is operating in what they consider their, their free will, but are being manipulated and, and deceived and manipulated into doing all kinds of anti-nature, uh, contrary to nature activity. And now... Just an example of that in New York, they passed the law. They tried to do it in Virginia. It hadn't, it's not going to pass, at least right away. Uh, the idea of uh, when your baby is born, you can still do an abortion, a very late-term abortion. Uh, someone termed it the uh, you know, fourth trimester ab abortion. Uh, now, that, that was passed in New York, as I understand it, by the state legislature. It was advocated by the governor of Virginia, and I, but I think it was shot down uh, in committee somewhere in, in Virginia, so it hadn't become. But, but now, I grew up on a farm, and, and we always had some horses, we had some cows, we had some hogs, we had some chickens, uh, dogs, cats, whatever, animals all around us. And, uh, and, and, the, and, you, and you work with the, all of them all the time. And, you, and with, with cows, they're you, generally speaking, just gentle as they can be. Pigs, maybe a little less so, but if you don't, you don't bother them, they probably won't bother you. Except, except if a cow has a calf or if a, if a, if a sow has some piglets, and you get around them, and you're in danger, because they will come after you. Absolutely. I mean, without, I mean, with zero reservation, they'll come after you. That's nature. Mankind, through satanic deception, you see what's happening? Through, now, n n nature, uh, 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 I, I say uh, husband and wife, and by, by pure nature would, would, would kill you if you tried to harm their offspring. Yep. But they're choosing to do the same thing themselves. Uh, that's satanic deception. That's, that's free will operating under satanic deception. When Jesus comes, you're still going to have free will, but there's not going to be satanic deception. I believe. Okay. All right, so God acted to limit evil. How long would he do that? Until he could work out his plan of redemption in the world. To do a plan of redemption, then he initiated redemptive activities uh, in the form of covenants, choosing a partner to work through uh, in his plan of redemption, and he made covenants with Abram, which is all-encompassing covenant, and then a more generalized or more specific covenant with the, with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, namely Israel, when they brought out uh, of Egypt and made covenant relationship. And he made them, he gave them stewardship of the land. They, they, now, somewhere in this whole plan of, that is evident from the scriptures, but he never, God never really says it, I think, but the, there's a 
particular geographical area that's sort of significant in his plan. And that's what we tried to document in the little booklet. Uh, I call it God's front porch. I think it's God's front porch. So, so he, he called, made this covenant with this people and said, I'm going to put you in charge of my front yard. I kind of, I'm kind of particular about this area especially, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give it to you, but actually what you're, you're charged to, to minister that area. And it's going to be how long? Forever. Okay. All right, so... And so God brought Israel into the land and, and uh, started working, revealing his plan of redemption. He did so through the, the kings and the prophets and so on. All right. And so uh, a thousand years after Abraham, God made a secondary covenant with the King David. <clears throat> and he said, I'm going to establish your, the, your son, Ben David, I'm going to establish his house, his kingdom, and his throne for how long? Forever. King David. So he established that covenant. And then it was another thousand years before Jesus came along to, in fulfillment of that. So it's a thousand years from Abraham to David, a thousand years from David to Jesus. And two thousand years from there to here. Uh, so uh, Two, a thousand years after David. Now, you, I won't take the time tonight because we want to go faster. But, but you, can, you can work through the descendants of David and what happened. And, and, and you know, God... So after, after the lineage of David supp supposedly was cut off, it looked like the covenant had failed. Jeremiah, the prophet of record, said, but God will raise a Tzemach. Tzemach. That's where I got that name. Tzemach for David. A sprout for David. And let's see, Jeremiah, um, 600 years after Jeremiah, the Zemach came forth. Is that right? Yeah, 600? Yeah, about 600. Okay. Uh, initiated by Jesus. So, so, so Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit you know, John the Baptist baptized him. He wasn't John the Methodist. Was he? No. He, he <laughs> Came up out of the water. Baptist born, Baptist bred. When he died, he'd be a Baptist dead. He was, he was a Baptist. <laughs> uh, John baptized him, and when he came from the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him without measure, and led him into the wilderness, and we've talked about that before. Uh, 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 the initiation of, a, of a, a, new, a, a new aspect of kingdom life uh, was manifested in and through Jesus. Uh, Jesus interacted directly with the Father, knew the Father, the Father knew him, knew Judea in Hebrew to know, to interact with, And so, and Jesus went through his, lived his life and ministry, preaching the message of the kingdom of God, and and eventually his secondary his secondary ministry was he was nailed to a cross as a sin offering for for the world, all the human race. Romans five eighteen is it that all men have been justified to life through this one act by Jesus? Okay, so so now. Because Jesus died for your sins and his blood cleansed you, then you could walk in the kingdom life in the same fashion that Jesus did. And so on the day of Yom HaShavuot, the Holy Spirit descended upon the 120 in the upper room. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they experienced the same thing that Jesus did uh, when he came up out of the water after John baptized them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. The only thing, they, they didn't go away and wait for 40 days to figure out what to do with it. They knew immediately what to do with it, see? That's what we do. So, anyway, that's here and there. Uh, they were filled, so, so they, began, they entered into this kingdom life, 
and sometime later you and I did the same thing. Every one of us approached this thing from a different direction, different background, different, different experience, but somewhere the blood of Jesus you, you acknowledge as a cleansing for your transgressions, which were many, I'm sure. And, and they were covered, and you believed to receive the Holy Spirit, and you did, and so you started perceiving in the kingdom. In other words, you now have the capacity to interact directly with the Holy One and He with you. Now, many of us at this stage in life, maybe I don't know what it is, whatever it is, you may feel like today is, my relationship is real puny. <laughs> uh, so, so and, and it probably is not. It probably is not. But you know, one of the things about uh, mankind, uh, uh, the, the human flesh, is any stimulation that you receive, if you receive the same stimulation over and over and over and over again, what happens to you? you it dulls. You, your response dulls. And I think that happens in our... I mean, what would just knock your socks off 40 years ago is kind of ho-ho-hum right now. I think that happens to us. So your relationship is probably not as frail as you think it is, or as I think mine is sometimes. So, okay. But you get up in Kentucky and sit there a few months, and you'll feel it's pretty frail. <laughs> so, okay. So Jesus initiated... Now, remember we talked about Dr. Flusser and, and his concept of Jesus, that Jesus introduced... Uh, this idea of the Messianic age, he introduced it, and then it would be it would be uh, re realized at his at his return. So at Jesus's return, uh, he will he uh, he will we believe that he will take a throne of David in Jerusalem, rule over Jacob. Is there any scripture that would back that? What's the prophecy that Gabriel gave to Mary? He'll rule over the house of Israel. He, he will sit on the throne of his father David and rule over the house of Israel for how long? Forever. Forever. Uh, so, so, we, so, that's, that's, so, so Jesus descends. You're changed in the process like popcorn. Poof. You're changed in an instant and you're joined with him. You're reigning in Jerusalem. Uh, and that's according to uh, John's, uh, John's prophecy in Revelation 20, verses 4 and 6. That, that period is for a thousand years. And so a thousand years. And, and Rabbi Wallman, uh, I believe in that day, Rabbi, you'll be in Jerusalem. And Rabbi Wallman said, you know, I used to visit those guys over in, over in Florida when they were over there. And, and if Rabbi Wallman is sick or kind of feeling the problem of age, he'll come to Jerusalem and he'll probably just back up to uh, the holy spot in Jerusalem and just be, he'll back his age up 20 or 30, 40 years. Somebody's got cancer in Minneapolis, they're going to get yourself to Jerusalem and just stand there and soak in the presence of God. Now, now, if our theory is correct that Adam would have lived forever had he not sinned, then if God's presence is in Jerusalem, in, the, in, in, in that dimension of glory, then anybody sick, they're going to go over there and be healed. Now, how many, how many people came to God or has come to Jesus and said, I want you to heal me, and he said, no, 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 you're supposed to be sick. How many people did he say that to? I don't think anybody. He tried to on a couple of occasions in the beginning. Who? Jesus. You know, what do I have to do? Oh, well, I, he was frustrated with them. I, I agree. I agree. But, but I, 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 you, you remember the, the, the woman that had an issue of blood, had 13 years, I believe, and, and she, she said, if I can just touch the zitzies. And she did, and boom! And, and, and Jesus said, who touched me? And the, and the does like, what are you talking about? We're in a crowd. 
people bumping you in every direction. No, 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 no. I felt the power go out. Or, you know what I mean. See? So, so I believe that in, in this, I believe, and now, now every time we come together for worship, now, as puny as we are, every time we come together for worship, it should be like a trial run for this. Now, we're limited, I, 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 probably by our own lack of faith, our own belief, whatever. We're limited, I guess. I don't know. But, but the theoretical, the, th in theory, that should be the case. If somebody, you know, if you're sick, you don't go to church because you don't want to spread it around. The reality is if you were sick, that's exactly where you ought to be. You see what I mean? I mean, now, now, now granted, we're puny, but okay. All right, and then after a thousand years, final judgment and a new creation, Revelation 21, 22. Every, everybody, that, that's the same vision. All right. Now I'm going to go quickly to the post-millennial vision. Uh, this won't take as long. Uh, the post-millennial thing, as far as the first several steps are the same, you know, the garden, uh, and, and everybody has a little bit different view of, uh, uh, you know, the role of Israel and covenants and so on, but we're just actually talking about uh, this last phase. Remember, in Revelation 20, verse 4 and verse 6 says that Jesus will reign for a thousand years. Specifically, they, uh, Daniel chapter 7 alludes to the same thing, but John spelled it out precisely. All right. Uh, so, so, the post-millennial view of, the, of, of prophecy is that Jesus started reigning on the earth on the day of Pentecost, or Yom HaShavuot. Okay? In other words, in, other words, uh, in a sense, he did, because he was uh, 120 in the upper room, with filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were, and they were uh, under Jesus' headship and uh, responsive to God, and, and so that entity was moving out into, into the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and so on. And so you can kind of, you can kind of understand a sense of that. But, but now we're 2,000 years down the line, and uh, it's not evident that everybody is under Jesus' authority yet. As a matter of fact, it almost looked like nobody is under Jesus' authority. Except, I mean, if you go into places like this, you'll find some, but, but uh, I mean, if you go to downtown New York what you, or San Francisco or wherever, you know. I was telling somebody the other day, one time when we lived in California, we went to San Francisco, we got there, it was after dark, and we couldn't find a restaurant. We looked all over, couldn't find a place. We ended up at a motel and ate gee out, out of the machine. <laughs> we did find the red light district. <laughs> Joe's mother was with us. She really appreciated that. <laughs> the ladies of the night was on every corner. <laughs> we're driving up. And, well, we weren't looking for it. We were looking for a restaurant. Couldn't find one. Okay. I, you got to really be from the country if you can't find a restaurant in San Francisco, I guess. Okay. So, all right. Um, so, their view is a th 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 this, this really was set forth, uh, I, th I think, probably clearest by Augustine. Uh, now, remember, uh, Augustine initially was uh, 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 held a, pr uh, a premillennial view, which, which I think was common in, in all the believers up until maybe basically down. Remember, by the time of Augustine, uh, the church power and Roman power had become intertwined. The so-called Holy Roman Church uh, uh, and empire and so on, and they were intertwined, and and uh, and and he he could see the extension of church power with Roman power, and and we're going to you know 
Now, he, he had, at his time, he still had 600 years to go to get to 1,000 years from the time of uh, the day of Pentecost. So there's plenty of time. Yes, sir. I'm not sure. Uh, he, he, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, he, uh, Augustine, uh, and I've forgotten the guy's name, but Augustine, you can, I think it's in Hebraic Roots, uh, Pelagius, 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 something like that. Uh, there was an argument in that day that he set forth that, uh, that uh, uh, every human being was born in the same position as Jesus was. Uh, and there was no such, in other words, he, he, he didn't acknowledge the fall, uh, that something real had happened in the so-called fall when Adam was driven out of the garden. In other words, all of us were born uh, pure and innocent and capable of what Adam had, and we only make bad choices. Augustine uh, argued against... Uh, uh, he would argue what has become called absolute depravity of the human soul. In other words, the human soul is absolutely lost. The, the human soul, uh, if it doesn't accept Jesus, is doomed. It, I mean, in ju final judgment. And and so and so, uh, those two they were that was a big debate in society, and Augustine prevailed. And that became the dominant church. Now, I'm not sure about purgatory one way or the other. Uh, the idea of purgatory, everybody knows what purgatory is? Uh, the idea of pur if you think about purgatory, uh, if, 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 they, if they knew about Schrodinger equation, they would never fall in for purgatory in the first place. See, because, see, because when, you, when you experience physical death, you step out of space-time. We, we really we know next to nothing about what happens after death. To be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. I mean, the scripture gives us a few things. But we, spe we step out of space-time. You are coupled to space-time through this physical body. You are a living soul, and we don't really know what that is. But you are a living soul, uh, entity with intellect, will, whatever, and you are coupled to space-time through this physical body. And at physical death, you are decoupled. And we don't know. Uh, I mean, other than the hint that the scriptures give us, that's, that's all. The, the spirit returns to God who gave it. We, we put the body back in the earth from whence it came. And uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so it's appointed once for man to die, and after that comes judgment. So, so you can, you can fact, piece together three or four scriptural statements along that line and kind of get a vague notion. But the truth is you're decoupled from space-time. Purgatory wants to reimpose space-time on that. So, so I always suggest that, that the reality is that we live in an event sequence not a time sequence. Now, our souls have been, because of this physical body in space-time, our souls have been conditioned to think always in terms of a time sequence. So we buy a, a car, and it gets old, and we junk it, we, and we just jack it up, put it in the front yard, take the wheels off. Oh, that's Kentucky, I forgot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, Castleberry, Castleberry, come and get you. Uh, but and you work, you buy a work machine, you put it on the front porch. <laughs> that's that's Kentucky also. You always know you're in Kentucky if you see the work machine on the front porch. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So anyway, anyway, um, uh, if we try to, if we try. Now, so we stepped out of space-time because we experienced physical death. And so, so if you're still back in space-time thinking about your uncle, or who just, I have a cousin in Illinois that we learned died today. Uh, uh, Billy, uh, Billy McQuarrie died. Uh, he stepped out of space-time. 
today. And now I'm looking at Billy McQuarrie. Well, I know I knew him as when I was a kid and whatever. And, and so, well, I, the Lord's, this judgment thing is going to be, uh, we don't know if it's 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years. It's sometime in the future. So Billy, Billy died today. And so he's going to have to wait. Judgment's 1,000 years from now. He's going to have to wait 1,000 years for that judgment to come along. So he's in, in between purgatory. So now, now if I'm a really uh, nice, good pastor, I can tell you, listen, I have a special relationship with the Lord. You got, <laughs> if you've got a relative in purgatory, I believe if you'll bring some real nice offerings in, I believe I can spend the time to pray them through and get them through purgatory. That's what they used to do, isn't it? That's what used to happen. Now, I never, I never did that, for sure. So, anyway, what we're doing with purgatory is trying to impose space-time on something that is outside of time. So, so because it's appointed once to die, and after that comes not 10 years or 20 years delay or something, after that comes judgment. We step out of, and we step into judgment. See, I, I think we experience physical death. We take one step, it's judgment. We take step number two, we're descending into Jerusalem. Without a concept of the inter... Uh, you only have those intervening years if you're still coupled to space-time. So, okay. Uh, let me go on. During the, during the era, the present time, Christ was seen as actually reigning through the church. And Jesus, at the end of the thousand years, Jesus returns literally. And now, at that time, everything will have been subjected to him through the church. This, you know, ever, ever, anybody ever hear of kingdom now theology? You know what that is? That's, that's the church asserting its authority in the earth. That's postmillennial thought. They're, they're asserting their authority. And that, 20 or 30 years ago, that got to be real popular. I don't, I don't hear anything about it much anymore. I don't know if it's still popular or not. Uh, and, then, and then at his return, it would go immediately to final judgment and then the new creation. So they, they get around the pre, post-tribulation thing because they're not pre, pre-millennial. That's not an issue to them. Okay. Questions about that? Everybody got that? Pretty sure? It's pretty easy. Well, it becomes amillennial. So it becomes just a general period of time. In other words, they, uh, uh, what's the word? They, uh, they generalize it. Yeah, they generalize it. it. It becomes just a, a type. There's a word for it. In a, what's the word I'm looking for, Pastor? A what? Allegory. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you use that word for often, uh, and I forgot it. I couldn't, I couldn't remember. It's, they use it, the thousand years as an allegorical long period of time. So, so we don't know. It's a, it becomes X, and so it's unknown. Uh, and so, but the same, same basic concepts. So, so, so they, they just envision that, the, that Jesus is reigning in the earth. Everything's coming under his authority. And he'll return when everything's under his authority. And so, okay, uh, let's get a let's get a uh, a gee dunk, yeah, yeah, and uh, we'll we'll finish this up. in there. And so the idea of the so-called Great Tribulation, that's a premillennial the premillennial meaning Jesus is coming to reign directly on the earth for a thousand years. 
And so, and so the idea of the, of the pre-tribulation rapture is that just preceding his reigning, then there's going to be a real kind of banging around. But, but those all pertain to pre-millennial pre view, post the amillennial. How do you reckon St. Augustine got around on what was written in the book of Revelation about, well, I guess he, he got around it by just the when, or the thousand yeah. years beginning, 2,000 yeah. years ago or next week. Yeah, yeah because again, remember at his time, he saw the church and Roman power expanding, even though the Roman Empire at that juncture, you know, 400 AD, was in decline. And the apex of Roman power was like 120 AD, I think, somewhere in that range. So it was, it was, in, but he, he envisioned the expansion of Roman power and, uh, and the church, and the church power and Roman power were like one and the same. Uh, uh, I read that when the when the Germans invaded Rome, finally they over they overthrew Rome in uh, 475 or six. One or the other. Uh, that it was the Pope that surrendered the city to. I believe it was. So, so that gives you an idea of where the church stood in in, in regard to Rome. I never, I never put that together from my, uh, from my uh, Joe, but
All right, let's go back to work, see where we can get to. Um, somebody asked a question a moment ago, uh, what groups are post-millennial, embrace post-millennial concepts? Anybody give us an idea? What denominations of Christianity would be post-millennial, you think? Catholic? Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church would be? How about Presbyterians? Presbyterians? I assume Episcopal, but I'm, I, I don't really know that much about them. Yeah, they, uh, most, I think mostly high church would be, uh, would be uh, post-millennial. So, so if, you, if you look at the Catholic Church in particular, you know, every, uh, the powers are consolidated under the Pope, and, and, so, and so he's like the figure of Jesus on the earth, and so, and powers, and and Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church has considerable amount of power throughout the world. Do you think? Yeah. Matter of fact, do they not have a seat in the UN? Yes. I believe they do. Yeah, I think so. Uh, that's right. And the United States has diplomatic relationships with the Vatican, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's true. So right. Okay. Want to we'll run along? So all of these. Now, so the idea of the these are post-millennial. You have to be pre-millennial before this tribulation thing becomes an issue. So basically, evangelical churches, uh, Bible-based evangelical, Pentecostal, whatever churches would be, uh, basically pre-millennial. Um, not all, but uh, again, you can find the exceptions whatever group you go into. But uh, generally speaking, that would be the case. Okay. All right, uh, now, uh, we, the, the development, did, I don't know if I wrote this up. Did I write this up? Uh, yeah, on uh, page 57 in my book, I think your number's a little bit different. The origin of the pre-tribulation rapture view, is that, what page is that? 60 in your book, probably. It's, uh, I've got an over, old copy, so. Yeah, origin of the pre-tribulation rapture view. And so I talk a little bit about the Plymouth Brethren Church. That's where this prophecy came forth. And then, and then uh, uh, popularized by John Nelson Darby. And then, and then, 
picked up by Schofield and from there, and, and I think Schofield was a doctor. I'm not sure of that. I think that's the case. Anyway, whatever the case, uh, Schofield Bible, and then, and then uh, uh, in modern uh, era, uh, popularized by Dallas Theological Seminary. I, when, I, when the Lord called me to be a pastor, uh, I almost busted a gut, as you might say, uh, to go to Dallas. I wanted to go to Dallas. Huh? The credentials. Credentials. That would be in the theolo evangelical theological world, it's Harvard. Uh, uh, so, so, but, and, and I could, I could, because I was already believing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit and I couldn't get through their application without, without lying. And, and what kind of witness would that be? <laughs> then what? Hey, I didn't want to do that. So that's, that sort of undermines <laughs> the whole issue. So, all right, okay. So we want to talk about um, Schofield then, took Darby's ideas and, um, and developed this view of redemption uh, in seven what he called dispensations. And if you've got a Schofield Bible, uh, then it, it is, is written, the notes and so on the Schofield Bible is basically set up on those seven dispensations. And they are innocence, that's talking about uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, the garden experience, uh, uh, a man with, uh, uh, under conscience or moral responsibility, uh, I don't know where he came up with that at, but anyway, um, that would be that would be uh, uh, that would be uh, Genesis uh, verses uh, chapter four and five, I guess. Uh, man under human government. This would be Noah to Babel. Man under promise. I'm using uh, his terminology. Man of the promise would be the covenant with Abraham down to Sinai. Uh, man under law, Sinai to uh, Sinai to Jesus. Church era or era of grace as opposed to law. And then the final one is the kingdom uh, and Jesus coming and reigning. So from his perspective, Jesus would be literally reigning on the earth for a thousand years. So in that sense, uh, we come to the same conclusion there, how to get there or something. So, so notice, notice between the church and the law age, this is, this is Israel and this is the church. So the church dispensation has replaced the uh, law dispensation. And, and one of the key scriptures there is chapter, John chapter 1, verse 17. Somebody got a King James, read that for us. Anybody got a King James here? Nobody got a King James? Not authorized here. No, no one's authorized. <laughs> King James version, John 1, 17. Um, from the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Okay, now if read Law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. Now think about that. that that's, like, that's like almost like if you read it that way, and it's the way it's written in King James, if you read it that way, it's almost like there's no grace and truth in the law, and there's no law in grace and truth. I mean, and that's, the, that's this interpret. This is the interpretation here. Now, I always say that there's no law without grace and there's no grace without law. The, the two are intimate, they're coupled. Uh, you can't have, it's like the old song, uh, love and marriage, can't have one without the other, I guess. And that was, that was pre-modern era, I guess, isn't it? Because I guess you can. Yeah, when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, this divorce thing is, is is strange in that regard. 
when I was about four years old. We lived in a hill farm back in Kentucky. And uh, something, something in our family was dark. Suddenly got really dark. I had no idea of what it was. It was just dark. I mean, it was actually darker than if somebody died. But nobody had died, but it was dark. You might hear mom and dad whispering in the back room about something, but you didn't know what it was. It was just dark. It was bad, dark. Now, later I learned what, what was causing the darkness. My uncle and his wife had got a divorce. That just, that just shows you the difference in viewpoint of now, that, that would have been uh, 46, 1946 or 47, somewhere in that era. So from that point to now, you can, you can see. I mean, the, the, the ideas have so radically changed. It's incredible. But that, I mean, it was, like I say, it was darker than if, it was darker than if somebody in the family had died. It was, I mean, you know, you, you, nobody talked. I mean, it was a black spot on the family. It was never, it was so tarnished, we could never out, outlive it. Uh, just incredible difference in how things are viewed. Okay, uh, so, so these are the dispensations set forth by Schofield. And, and so in, in, uh, uh, this, this, this helps him to, exp this helped him to explain then uh, a part of the theory around the pre-tribulation rapture. And so, uh, so if you've got a Schofield Bible, it's set up on that basis. Uh, Lewis Schaefer. Everybody ever hear of Lewis Schaefer? Dean at Dallas Theological Seminary. John Wildward. Dwight Pentecost, the, all of these are the forerunners of Hal Lindsey and then Hal Lindsey popularized it. Okay, okay. Now, so let's look at some scriptures then that deal with this subject area and see which one of these models we might want to want to embrace. All right, so Revelation eleven fifteen. Uh, the seventh angel sounded, seventh trumpet, in the sequence from Revelation 8 through 11, there's a sequence of seven trumpets. This is the great trumpet, the last trumpet, the seventh. Seven in the scriptures usually imply completion, the seventh trumpet. And it's sounded, and uh, the judgment's coming upon the earth. This is the final judgment coming upon the earth. The kingdom of the earth has become the kingdom of God and his Messiah, and he will reign forever. <clears throat> now, from, the, from God's standpoint, from your standpoint, this is a hallelujah. Uh, but from a world standpoint, this is a judgment. And that's how it's seen in the book of Revelation, a judgment. <clears throat> each, trumpet, each trumpet signifies a sequence of more and more severe judgments coming up on mankind. And this is the final, ultimate judgment. Okay? Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about the pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul uh, 1, 7, says that we're waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Again, doesn't really tell us too much about the... Now, this one, this, is, this one, I believe, is important. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. Paul outlines a sequence of, of, uh, of our present time, present age. <clears throat> and I'll just uh, we'll read this, go back and look at it. Now, we, now what, what had happened at Thessalonica is, remember in those days there was no Fox News or CNN or anything else. And so the only way you got news was if somebody came to town, a traveler. That's how you got news from somewhere else. So when Paul showed up at a place, and he had been in Jerusalem, even though it was eight months prior to that, he brought news of what was happening in Jerusalem. 
Now, we, again, we live in a unique age because I can remember uh, several years ago, <clears throat> we subscribed to the international edition of the Jerusalem Post, and we got news that was no more than a week or so late. <coughs> and it was, I mean, that's what we learned about what was going on in Israel. This is 1980-ish, somewhere in that range. Now, today... I mean, you know, I, every morning I look at Eric Sheva, Jerusalem Post, uh, Shiloh Musing, uh, Debka Fowl, and uh, <coughs> Pipes, Daniel Pipes. That's their websites. And so I, I read what, what's happening uh, in the land. But, but that's something, again, that's in our modern age that's available to us. Uh, <coughs> anyway. In that day, somebody, uh, Paul, he'd been in Jerusalem. He's traveling, walking halfway around the world. Eight months, ten months later, he's in Thessalonica. What's happening in Jerusalem? So he'd teach all night. Uh, here's the latest thing that's happening in Jerusalem. And so that's, that's the only way they had to find out. Uh, I, you know, the Roman soldiers came again. I guess there was some scuttlebutt that way, whatever. I don't know. Anyway. Somebody had written a letter to the church at Thessalonica saying, uh, boys, you didn't make the cut. <laughs> Jesus came and you missed. You were left behind. <laughs> and they were saying, hey, wait a minute. We thought we were filled with the Holy Spirit. We were sure we had tickets. And we got left behind? What's going on? So Paul writes them a letter and says, hey, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ or our gathering together to him, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by spirit or message or letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord's come. It hadn't come yet. How did, how did Augustine address that? I don't know. <laughs> now, I underlined, that's my underline, not his, but I underlined, to me, he, he lists three specific events which I believe occur concurrently. The coming of the Lord, our gathering to him, and the day of the Lord. I, I, he's, in my estimation, he, Paul is putting all three events, as, uh, just three different names for the same event. So he's telling me it hadn't happened yet. It's going to happen, but it hadn't happened yet. So to me, this scripture nullifies the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. Secret, secret coming of the Lord, secret rapture. Okay? Now, anybody got comments or suggestions or questions, uh, toss them out. It's okay. You won't, you won't embarrass me badly. If I get really mad, I'll just leave and let Pastor take over. <clears throat> He'll sue your... You know, he's, you know, he used to call me General Ken, but... <laughs> so... All right, let's go on. Now, now, if you thought that was good, this is much better. Matthew 24. Now, these are, yeah, these are the words of a special guy right there. Whose words are these? These are Jesus' words. Then a sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Now, who are the elect of the Son of Man? His elect. His elect. Who are his elect? Do you believe it? You, that pertains to you? I yeah yeah I I I think I think. It, pardon. In the Greek, it means both. Both what? Uh, I don't think so, but I'll let you have that idea if you want to, uh, because because prophetically, pro- prophetically Israel's already there. Yeah, in in the in the event of the in, of of the, of the seventh thing, Israel's already in the land. Now, there is, there is a prophecy 
Can I think where it's at? Ooh, ooh, ooh. It hurts. Uh, about Isaiah 28. I'm not sure. Somewhere in that range, there, there is a prophecy where, where, <clears throat> where uh, the great trumpet will sound and it gather the elect. Of, and it is talking about Israel there. Uh, from, I think it's talking about uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt, maybe. At, at that point. I'm, I'm not sure. I'd like to remember where that's at, but I don't remember. Is that Isaiah 27? You got it over there? Uh, all right. So I, did, I couldn't remember where it was at, but it's in that neighborhood. Uh, but it talks about uh, in gathering, and so, so uh, uh, go ahead and read it if you would, please. Okay, so that's a reference to the ingathering. Now, I think Isaiah is talking about Israel uh, ingathering there, so you can apply it in that sense. Uh, but when it says his, his, it's talking about Jesus and his elect, I, I think that focuses pretty well on his disciples, those that are following Jesus, those that are born of the Spirit, and so on and so forth. So, so, uh, so now this is, Notice that this is not a secret thing. The whole earth sees it, and what, what's their response? Oh, no. It was true after all. It was true after all. Can I... Now, what, what has been the response of the Gentile min, mindset, power brokers in the world, of the ingathering of the Jewish people to the land, and... And the, and the growth of the faith of Jacob in the land. If, if, you, if you were to go to the State Department and sit down with the leaders in the State Department, uh, if you were to go to uh, some sort of special committee in the, in the parliament in Israel, I mean in England, whatever, how, how do you think that they look at faith, uh, the growing faith of the Israeli people living in the land of Israel? Big problem, yeah. As a matter of fact, one famous, famous English parla uh, 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 parliament member, I, I get, their, get their bodies named, uh, I, I won't repeat what he, he called it, a uh, excrement little nation. If you, I, somebody might remember that statement. He referred to Israel. That's, it was, that's, that was his viewpoint. Uh, uh, so, so, so Israel is a problem. Now, now you might look at Mr. Trump, and you might say, "Well, he's done this, he's done that," and and maybe he has a different viewpoint. I don't know, but I would, I would, I would suggest that there is at least a reasonable prospect that he does, because everybody hates him. <laughs> everybody, I mean, he's the biggest charlatan that's ever hit the, uh, ever hit the. Earth, I mean, and in in the in the Beltway, you can get some real professional charlatans, and uh, and he's the worst of them all for sure. So uh, I I'm kind of suspicious on that regard, uh, and and maybe Mr. Trump will come up and give us all a real negative shock one of these days, and everybody will say I told you he was a charlatan. Maybe it'll happen. I don't know, uh, uh, but but so far. I mean, I, I've been hearing we're going to move the embassy to Jerusalem for decades. It's there. Uh, I don't know about you, but my 401k is doing all right. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to boast or anything, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it's. I'm like Mr. Klein. I've been rich and I've been poor, and I prefer rich. <laughs> I mean, you know, just given everything else, uh, you know. All right, so, so his elect gathered from the four winds, this great trumpet. 
What great trumpet? The great trumpet with its sound. Oh, let's go and look at that. Uh, first, now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through this and go to the next one because this is a long one and it's just preliminary to this is where I went. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Okay, Jesus is coming, shouting with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. That sounds like what we saw in Matthew, isn't it? And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we'll always be with the Lord. This is a great trumpet gathering his elect. Now, I wish he would have said, and we're all going to descend on Jerusalem with Jesus. He didn't write that. I wish he had a... Uh, but he didn't. If he'd done that, the Gnostics wouldn't have liked him so much, but whatever. Uh, uh, I think, I think Paul didn't ever entertain the notion that he needed to write that down. I think. It's so obvious. <laughs> Where is this thing going? Okay, let's go on. If we endure, we also reign with Now, this is just more general, but we will reign with him. Now, does, does he need somebody to reign with him in heaven? Or is that... That's pretty well covered. Uh, oops. Oh, I'm going to back up. Now, Mr. Helene called this to my attention, and I didn't know about it, and I'm, I'm, I was disappointed in myself. Um, everybody know who Corey Ten Boone is? Uh, Joe and I were in Holland in a long time ago, and, uh, and we... Uh, Walked all over the place. It's it's in Harlem, and uh, to find her place, and I found it two or three different times, <laughs> but she finally found it. <laughs> uh, it. I mean, you know, it's not it's hardly marked. It's hardly marked. The house where they li where they live. He ran a watch. Uh, her dad ran a watch shop, and they hid Jews. Her story, and they got they got turned in eventually. Her and she and her sister were put in uh, Ravenbrook, was it? I think one of the, Ravenbrook, I think, but I'm not sure. Is that the name of one of the, Ravenbrook? Is that a concentration camp? Something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, her sister, uh, Betsy, I think her name was, died in the camp. And so she came out of the camp and a, a powerful preacher. Uh, and they had been, they'd been Christian Zionists, you know, in the 30s. Uh, uh, they're in in Holland, and so she she was she she for years was a very very bold preacher, and so early on she went to um, China. And I that's what I said I didn't know about. It. Uh, she was preaching in China, giving testimony. That's what she really did, give testimony, and and uh, this pre-tribulation rapture thing was popular theory there. And uh, in, in the process of that, the Red Revolution overran them, and and Mao Mao that's his name Mao, uh, he managed to kill off millions of believers, and they were waiting for the rapture to get out, and so their faith was terribly shaken, and she was given warning against pre-tribulation rapture theory. It's not realistic. It's not biblical. And 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 and, and that was a, now we in America are totally untested. Now I don't think that's going to. I think that's going to change. I think it's in the process of changing, radically. But at the present, I mean, I have virtually almost no real challenge to. Now. I did get a letter one time from a KKK that was written on behalf of a Jew-free and a Jew-stooge-free America. <laughs> I was, I was a Jew-stooge, of course. <laughs> so I always, I always treasure that letter. <laughs> now everybody gets a letter from the KKK, you know. So, so anyway, anyway but you know. I, I, we were out. At the, we were heading out to Dorsex one time when you lived out in the swamp, and uh, and uh, drove through Oviedo by the 
by the little greasy spinner, which is not there anymore. We drove through there the other day. It's still there. It's just gradually the hot path. But it's not on the corner where I was before. Oh, okay. All right. What? Yeah, I guess that was it. Anyway, there were three or four KKK guys out there on the corner demonstrating one Saturday morning. I think that was the only KKK people I ever really saw. I, I mean, actually, out there demonstrating. So, uh, but, anyway, anyway, I, I, faced, I faced almost no threat. What, what, what would evangelical Christians do in this country if a wave of persecution hit and literally thousands were killed, became martyrs with this theory. You know, we're, we're getting out before, before the stuff hits the fan, you know, we're getting out. Uh, so I, th I think it's a horrible theory. All right, in your book, I'm trying to wrap this up. In your book, I, uh, so, so I, I, I think what you have to do is really parse the words real carefully to get document, documentation, scriptural documentation for the concept. You, you, know the, you know the parable of the wheat and the tares? You remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? You know, if, if the pre-tribulation rapture theory was correct, you know you would have to take out the wheat before you took out the tares? You, you ever think about that? You, you'd have to reverse that. And, and since Jesus gave it, I figured, man, I, maybe he knows. I mean, I'm, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Right? And Tim agrees, so, so we're going to give Jesus the benefit of the doubt since we figure he knew. Okay? I, I, I cannot find a basis for it. I just cannot find it. Yeah, and they said, no, 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 no. Yeah, that's right. So, so okay. Uh, now, I, I just, now, now pre-tribulation rapture is not Gnosticism, but it seems to me to have a similar impact. Uh, because because from, from what I can understand, we are we are living we are the i think we're the like the most blessed generation up to this age because we live in the age that we see these things actually being fulfilled and we live in the age of being fruitful to have have a potential for fruitfulness incredible fruitfulness we have the capacity of incredible fruitfulness uh, uh, and and all, most of you, maybe all of you, I don't know, most, but most of you I know, have walked in the land alongside of your Israeli counterparts, and you, you've had witnesses deep in your soul of the faith that's working there, and, and just the hand of God that's moving things, and, and you've had, you've been beneficial, a, a tremendous confirmation of that uh, in, in, your, in your own soul and so you've, you've come back uh, I remember the first time that I was leaving Israel coming back to the States my prayer was and, and I, thought, I thought of myself as sort of a, a spiritual green beret I overestimated myself that's the only time in my life I did that I guess <clears throat> so uh, but anyway anyway I was so humbled by that first experience in the land that my prayer as I was returning to the States was, Lord, please make me as fruitful as one of these so-called unbelieving Israelis. Because I saw such faith operating in them that, that I was amazed. And so, and so... And so I knew, and that was almost 40 years ago. Whew, 40 years ago. Hard to believe. It was 40 years, 1980. And I knew that whatever it is that I had to do in the Lord, it had to major in Israel. 
because that's where that's where the business was happening. That's now there might be some wonderful things happening here, and I suppose there are. You have great revivals. You have humanitarian efforts. You have all kinds of stuff. It's wonderful, uh, and and people ought to participate. Uh, uh, Joe Joe was talking about a lady that used to be a member of the church here. Uh, that that really really had a had a burden and picket in, in in front of the abortion clinics, and and she 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 kind of fussed at us a little bit for not not really participating in it, and and my my burden my burden was somewhere else was in Israel, and that's where that's where my focus was. But and then I can see what's happening in New York and Virginia and whatever, and and gosh, uh, that that. She was right on. That, I mean, that was, that was a, such a valid thing. Uh, uh, but we had our focus, our priority, and that was it. So we did. Uh, I think the pre-tribulation rapture says to people, uh, nothing really important is going to happen before God jerks you out. And so just go ahead and, you know, watch the ball game kick back because you're saved, you're checked in, uh, nothing really is important is going to happen and you're his favorite and he's going to jerk you out before anything significant happens and so just rest, be, be at peace and so and so, uh, real believers that should be participants in, in this thing today are sitting on their duff waiting for the evacuation orders. Waiting to be evacuated when the Lord is saying, charge. Gear up and charge. I, that's, to me, the real, the real danger of, it just renders people, uh, and I, I put some, I put some uh, comparisons of, uh, of Gnosticism, uh, and, and, and uh, there, there is some, there is some, reason of comparison I, I don't know how valid it is uh, but but the real thing that gets me is that is that people that ought to be being fruitful uh, are have been rendered useless when the world is facing its greatest challenge and and now again, you've been there, you've done it, but uh, to show up in Israel and Jesus in the midst of you and see see the faces of those people of faith light up because of Jesus in you, man, that's high cotton, folks. That's high cotton. I mean, I mean, man, if that doesn't run chills up and down here. Or nothing, nothing real. And, and and you've seen it. You know it's true. Um, gosh, that's, that's rich stuff. That's enough to sustain me. Keep me, keep me focused, and keep me marching. I'm an old dude now, uh, but I'm 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 going to the gym in the morning, and I'm eating stuff that don't taste good. And I, because I'm optimistic, I'm, I, I, will, I will see this event. Now, I'm, I'm hoping to be included one way or the other, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see it from space-time. See? All right, questions or comments? Pardon? No, I think it is space-time. I would say so, yeah. That's my, uh, Re Revelation 20, 20, verses 4 and 6 says, he will reign on the earth. Uh, somebody read that. Don't, I didn't put that up there. Somebody, Revelation chapter 24, I'm sorry, chapter 20, verses 4 and then verses 6. Uh, talks about the first, the first resurrection. And, and, and it says that the latter part... Actually, actually, in chapter 20, verse 4, in the early parts of that verse, it looks like he's talking about martyrs. 
Some, somebody read that. Uh, that's worthwhile. Tw- yeah, chapter... Okay, now it's if you're learning, it sounds like a pretty elite group there, huh? Now, but every other place in the Bible that talks about uh, His coming and our gathering together, uh, the whole all that belongs to Him is coming. Paul wrote First Corinthians 15. All those that belong to Him at His coming. So I have faith that I belong to Him when He comes. So so it, it, it doesn't. There's no hint of a special special group so uh, so even though that kind of sounds like it's a elite you know just the real green berets there i i think i think it's a whole whole party all right and 20 uh, 20 verse 6 blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay. Now, and he's he's coming to earth and reigning, so my presumption is that reign is on earth and hence space time. Yes, sir. On the earth, yeah. Read that if you would. Revelation chapter 5. John is caught up to the throne of God and he sees the lamb breaking the seals, and uh, and uh, and he cries out, Who, "Who's who's worthy to break the seals?" And he weeps. And the angel said, "Wait, wait, the lamb, the lamb." And then, go ahead and read that if you got it, there. That's good. Chapter five, I'll read uh, verse ten. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests, so uh, they will reign on the earth. On the earth. Yeah. 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 So. put up there the scripture, Revelation 11, 15. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord, of his Christ, and he shall reign forever now. Okay? Yep. Uh, of what? Oh. Uh, the, the stone that broke the uh, feet and uh, all the things. And then, yeah, I think that's, that's talking about Jesus as the kingdom established. Dan, Daniel's uh, prophecy interpretation of a dream of Nebuchadnezzar uh, was of the statue head of gold breast of the shoulders was silver, midsection of uh, brass, bronze, the legs of iron and bronze, and the iron and, and the feet of clay and iron mixed. And, and, so, and then there was a stone cut out of a mountain without hands, and it crushed the feet, and then the whole thing. And, and this, uh, whatever, rains, rains on the earth forever or whatever. And yeah, it's a picture of the, it's the same thing, I think. The coming, the coming kingdom. The, the kingdoms of the world have become, the kingdom of the world have become the kingdom of God and his Messiah. Yeah. I think making the point that the, the singular, the kingdom yep. of the world, there is only one, one kingdom of the world, and then there's the kingdom of God. You don't, you always hear it as plural, kingdoms, but yeah. that's not what it says. Remember, when the Holy Spirit led Jesus in the wilderness and tempted him, you know, and one of the temptations is he showed them all the kingdoms of the world, and I think throughout the ages, and said, these, these are, the, I, I'm, I'm in control here. And if you'll bow down and worship, I'll give them to you. And Jesus said, no. <laughs> You shall what serve the Lord 
worship him only, whatever, uh, whatever. Uh, I, 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 I think, I think God had spoken to Jesus this, this prophecy and hundreds of others that says basically the same thing. You're, you, you're going to be the stone cut out of the, you are the stone cut out of the mountain without hands that's going to crush the thing and you will be Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And, and so he came out preaching the kingdom of God with that in mind. Satan challenged that with a, with a, you can take a shortcut through the pastor and get there faster. Here's how we do it. I know how we can fulfill that prophecy. If you just bow down to me. See? That's just like, just like if, if you're a pastor of this congregation or any other congregation. Uh, you, you can see... Now, if you're an American, you want to grow and prosper, don't you? I mean, that's the American way. That's, that's, I mean, if you're not growing and prospering, uh, something's wrong with you. I mean, how many pastors' conferences did I go to? And, you know, stay, stay away from that's a, that's a, How big is your church? Well, I don't have a church. Jesus got a church. I don't have one. And, and uh, you, y'all remember uh, uh, what was the guy from West Virginia? Uh, the, he died, and his wife lived up in Deltona. We don't see her. Uh, yeah, uh, I can't think of her name. Gosh, that's terrible. Anyway, he he. I think it's Irish. So he gave me a big shepherd staff. There's a name for the thing. I don't know. It's all twisted. It's kind of Burks. Uh, uh, Burks. Uh, he gave me it, and so I always, I always carried it. Calvin. Calvin. I always carried it around because, because I could go to the pastors' conference when they said, "How big is your staff?" I said, "Yeah, have I got a, <laughs> have I got a staff?" <laughs> 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 you got you got to come out and see. <laughs> you got to come out and see my church staff. <laughs> so, so. All right, are we through? If we're through, we're through. I mean, I, we 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 can come back next week and do Schrodinger equation again. <laughs> If you like. No, if if we're through, listen. I, let me let me let me tell you. Uh, thank you. Uh, how deeply I appreciate the opportunity to come and to interact in this in this manner. It, it's it's been for me life from the dead, for sure. I deeply appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome. You get, you get, are you getting this? (laughs) Okay.